<laughs> Did you see so, this gentleman's tattoo over there? What? Right there on his arm, his left arm. Really? Yeah, right he was there. He's talking to you. Yeah. <gasps> Zane! Our son is Abraham Zane. We were 100% sure that he was going to be Zane Abraham, but the Lord interrupted our plan. So we'll have to She hear. may have been 100% sure, but yeah. I knew. Awesome. That is so awesome. So we're going to have to hear more. Like, can I see it really quick? It's for his uncle. Oh. It's my uncle Zane. That's his uncle. My daughter's named after him. Your Zane daughter's name? Zane so Kendall. Wow. And I see at the foot of a cross, blooming, life, ribbons, joy, yeah. birds, what? Okay, sh just you gotta stand up and we gotta see. <laughs> this is prophetic art right here. <laughs> Thank you so much. We have for never sure, even met, sure. so <laughs> this could be awkward. But I just saw it. I just saw the so Zane. Yeah, yeah, That's you can amazing. flex. That's a good. Show yeah. it off. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's so good. I love it. So. Um, what I discovered when my brain blew up and all of my conclusions were gone was that I no longer could look at anyone the way that I had looked at them before, including myself. And I had not realized that I was standing on so many foundations that were built on conclusions. I don't know if you, you know, have thought about that too, but I realized that I had conclusions about everything. I had conclusions about gravity. I had conclusions about the sky being blue. I had conclusions about my husband. I had conclusions about myself. I had conclusions about every single thing, and those conclusions were creating the reality that I was living in before it even happened, right? Because the lens by which you see something affects the way that it behaves. In fact, even scientifically, we know that this is true. That when you look at even subatomic particles, your perspective and the fact that you view it changes the way they behave. And so I was discovering that because I was one neural synapse away from my conclusions, I was now free to think whole new thoughts. And this was such a gift that the Lord gave to me because he said, let's think whole new things. And so I took everything that I thought I knew about anything, which by the way, we don't even know what that is, right? I took it all and I put it like on a table in my mind. And I went, Lord, I don't want to have any conclusions about anything until you and I have a conversation about it. So everything is fair game. My spouse, me, the way the world works, the reason the church is this, my parents, relationships, business, jobs, finance, money, love, passion, everything, war, evil. I don't want to think about any of it unless you and I have a conversation because I want to remain in this unconcluded place. And it was such a gift to me. In fact, I remembered it was almost like going back to seminary because I used to go to, I went to Fuller Seminary, so grateful for that experience. And at the time that I went there, one of the passions that they had was to um, teach from the whole scope of Christianity. So they would have what some people would cons consider extremely conservative perspective and an extremely liberal perspective. And every class you took, whether it was women in ministry, whether it was church history, whether it was Old Testament survey, no matter what class you were taking, they would share the perspective of the extreme liberal alongside the perspective of the extreme conservative. And part of the reason they almost had to do this was because at the time it was the biggest international school in our country. So you would be sitting next to more people from around the world than you would be sitting next to Americans. And their experience of God and their perspectives were much different than the westernized church that I had grown up in. And so I was sitting next to people who believed radically different things about God that I thought eliminated them from God, and yet here they were having a vibrant relationship with God. And I'm thinking, oh wow, I am so limited in my thinking that I thought that what we believe about God actually, you know, matters. <laughs> because who he is is so much more important than what we believe about him. And so I discovered there were people who believed that the Bible was a bunch of theories, um, fables, myths, and legends by an ancient, ancient group of people, and, an, an, you know, and that really pretty much none of it was true. And I had people in our class who believed that the scripture itself was the holy word of God written through people and that there was not a single error or mistake down to the very last, there's no dotting of I's by the way, but you know, <laughs> down to the very last dot. I had that two huge perspectives, and these people were sitting side by side, 
having a vibrant and alive relationship with God, and it blew up my brain. And it made me realize that we have been standing on foundations that we totally have been unaware of. And when that young man prayed for me, the Lord gave me a gift by helping me step off a few of my foundations. In fact, C.S. Lewis talks about this very same thing in his essay called The Abolition of Man. Has anybody read it lately? It's <laughs> right, it's so good. And he says, what has happened unfortunately in our educational system is that we have taught kids concepts before the age of reason. And they have accepted these concepts as their foundational belief system before they ever knew they had the choice. And then it affects their perspective of every other choice past that. And so he goes, I believe this is one of the failures of the educational system. It is the abolition of man. That we have lived from perceptions and concepts that we accepted into our life before the age of reason. And you know what the most detrimental ones are? The ones that you made about yourself. You have perceptions and agreements about who you are, who we are, based on pains, hurts, successes and failures that has created a foundation that you stand on that has nothing to do with truth and has nothing to do with who God says you are or who you were made to be. And I believe that God is shifting that in our lives and he's opening up a season for us to awaken to our true selves to awaken into our identity. So I have to check my time because we're off. Okay, so I get to share some of my favorite things and I think that we might be doing part one of a two-part series. We'll just see how far we go because... Well, since you just got through the first card and you're leafing through 15 more. I know. <laughs> Here's where the Lord took me. He goes, Ange, in order to have this conversation, we have to go back to the Garden of Eden. And I was like, can you just shoot me now? Because I do not want to go back. I mean, oh. That's my favorite, though. Is it really? I love that Genesis book. Really? Oh, yeah. Have I not ever known this? Or are you being sarcastic? No, I'm it's serious. To know this with you you right don't now. like it? I love it. I didn't say I didn't like it. I just was sick of it. Wow. Because I felt like I'd been taught it like five million times. I don't know if any of you feel like that. But I felt like, is there anything new? Of course, there's five million new things in there. But here's what the Lord wanted to show me was he took me back to Genesis 3, where Adam and Eve are in the garden, and however you see scripture, whether you see it as the literal word of God or an ancient story, here's the cool thing. God has something to say to us tonight. And the beautiful thing is that we don't have to worry about each, what each other believes about God, because God himself is so big that he will walk all of us off of our false foundations and, be, and show us who he really is. Isn't well, that God crazy? has something to say to us all the time, not just tonight here. Why? Well, that's so true. Good point. That's why he doesn't say a lot, but when he does, it's really good. <laughs> so he took me back to Genesis 3, and he pointed out something, and he said, you know, there was something that happened in the Garden of Eden, and that is that when Adam and Eve were looking at the fruit, what, what did they want when they were desiring that fruit? When they found that the fruit was good for what? And it was desirable. Wisdom. It was good for wisdom. What they wanted was wisdom. And the tree itself was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so what Adam and Eve were looking for were a, a perspective, a lens that would make them like God. And that lens, I'm going to have you divide the board if you wouldn't mind. It says, and when they ate of that fruit, what happened? Their eyes were opened. Right? So it happened. Something happened where they came into a new perception. And the perception that they came into did what? As soon as their eyes were opened, they saw now for the first time that they were naked and they were ashamed. And then God walked in the garden and they were afraid. And then they spoke with God and there was what? Blame and accusation. So as a result of eating of a tree of the knowledge and experience of good and evil, blessing and calamity, came a perspective that produced what? Shame, fear, blame, and accusation. So I have always heard that story told that the reason this all went awry on earth was because we disobeyed. Anybody hear that? 
This is the big deal. If we would all just learn how to be more obedient, we would solve the problem. Has anybody been successful at that? Because if you are, I'd like you to come and raise my children for me. Right? So the, di no, no, you're so good, you're so good, but I'm just saying they would do a better job than me because I am super unsuccessful at doing what all of us have tried to do. And if the issue in the garden is about obedience and disobedience, what does that say about our relationship with God? That the foundation that we stand on with God is about obedience and disobedience. And out of that foundational belief, what has happened? It has come these other ideas like sin separates us from God. When Jesus himself says nothing, and Paul affirms nothing can separate us from the love of God. So it, it, out of this perspective comes all these other perspectives that I think go awry. And so there is this perspective, and I would, would you just do the fear, shame, blame, accusation sure. deal right, yeah, right along here, here down here? here well, not yet. Plane. Just okay. do these. Thank you. You're so good. So I believe that what happened in the eating of this fruit wasn't about obedience and disobedience. And that's what I was raised on. In fact, if you open up your NIV Bible with beautiful people who are well, well researched, who really know their stuff, they will tell you. And the issue that happened in the garden was disobedience. And the entire Old Testament is the story of a God who loves a people who continue to be what? Disobedient. That is a sad, sad story. I just feel defeated thinking about it. So let me propose a different perspective. What if our issue is not about obedience and disobedience? What if when you warn your kids not to do something and they do it anyway and they experience the harm of having done it anyway, why did that happen? Let's give you an example. I tell my kids don't touch our glass hot stove, our glass stove, because it gets hot, right? And I tell them never to touch it because you can't tell whether it's hot or not hot. If they disobey and touch the hot stove, do they get burned because they disobeyed or do they get burned because the stove was hot? <laughs> right? Thank you. It's, I am warning them about the natural consequence of the nature of the stove. So it, disobedience is irrelevant. Obedience is irrelevant. I am warning people I love, my children, about the nature of something. If I tell my kids, don't play in the street, and they play in the street and they get hit and harmed, did they get hit and harmed because they disobeyed? Or did they get hit and harmed because the nature of the street is that it's dangerous? Right? So that shifts everything. Because now our relationship with the Lord isn't about obedience and disobedience. It is about a God who is warning the people that he loves about the nature of something and what it will do to us. God was warning Adam and Eve that the nature of a tree of knowledge of good and evil would be death to them. That a perspective that is counter to his perspective would be death to them. In fact, that word, when they took and ate of the tree, that same word knowing is, occurs in the Hebrew, which is when Adam knew Eve and she became with child. So when she took in something that produces after its own kind, that's the same kind of thing that happened with the tree. So they took in a perspective that produces after its own kind. And it is that perspective that I think is what sin really is. Sin isn't about a behavior. Sin is about a proposed perspective that is harmful and damaging to us. Jesus even affirms this in Matthew, I want to say 11. Maybe you could correct me on this. Right around the Sermon on the Mount, he says, you have heard it said that it is a sin to do this, but I say to you that if you even want a woman in your heart you have sinned right you have heard it said that if you have ang or if you murder it's sin but I say to you if you have anger in your heart against someone that it's sin was he trying to throw us into even more legalism I don't think so I think what he was trying to do was to go I need you to understand it's not about the behavior it's if you accept a perspective that is counter to who you are and who I made you to be it will be death to you 
that he's trying to help us get out of this behavior mindset and into an understanding that it's about the perspectives that we accept into ourselves. In fact, Proverbs 8, 9, and 10 outlines this really clearly. Um, and I love this. Proverbs talks about wisdom. And wisdom as a woman who's standing at the gate and folly or foolishness as another perspective standing at a gate calling to everyone who will enter in come and listen to me and wisdom the person of wisdom who I believe is the Holy Spirit although it's debatable some people think it's Jesus some people think it's the Holy Spirit I'm currently in the Holy Spirit camp <laughs> You can hear the Holy Spirit laughing at me going, it's not really necessary that you know this, but anyway, that's, I'll have to be honest with you, I thought all communications were from the Holy Spirit for a really long time, and then later I realized, was some of that you, Jesus, and some of it you, Father, but I kind of was freaked out about both of you, so you all just pretended to be the Holy Spirit, and they're like, yeah, pretty much we did. <laughs> what? They're so funny. I just love, they'll just do, you know, they'll just do what they need to do to help us connect, right? So. This person of wisdom says, hey, if you want to know how things really work, and this is beautiful, it's in Proverbs 8, 9, and 10, so you can look it up. This person of wisdom, and in lieu of time, I'm just going to paraphrase it. This person of wisdom says, if you want to know how things work, I was here. Before the foundations of the world, before the circle was drawn on the deep, before anything was set in the earth, I was here. I, as a master craftsman, stood with God and created all things that exist. And it was daily my delight to stand before God and dance regarding what? The sons of men. The person of wisdom who is here, who knows how everything works, stands daily with God, dancing and delighting regarding you. And it is wisdom's joy and honor to teach us all things. That was such good news because I've been wanting wisdom and thinking like it was being held back from me. And the Lord is going, oh no, it was only these perceptions that clouded your view. It is these perceptions that came into your life before the age of reason that have made it impossible for you to hear me clearly. And then Proverbs goes on to talk about this other wisdom, this foolishness, and what it does to deceive people. And the Lord started to help me understand there are two wisdoms in the earth. There is the Holy Spirit's perspective, and then there is this other perspective that is death to us. And the reason why God didn't want for humanity to take part of the knowledge of good and evil <laughs> before they ate of the tree of life is because that physical experience of that perspective is death to us. That perspective makes us feel fear, blame, shame. It is a perspective that shifts us. And wisdom, who I believe is the Holy Spirit, and so, oh, hang on, backing up for just a second. So if this is sin, it results in behaviors that then become harmful to us. We get a suggestion, we make an agreement, and then the result is a behavior. Doesn't that change things just a little? I mean, come on, doesn't that change things just a little bit? Because I've been trying to change behaviors all my life and going, why am I feeling so powerless? When Jesus said, and Paul affirmed, we become transformed by what? Trying harder? doing more, gritting our teeth and trying to be more obedient, we become transformed by the renewing of our mind. So if this sin issue isn't about behavior, it's actually about perspective, then our mind being renewed creates the transformation that results in a changed behavior. That was so right, yes. That was what was so freeing to us because Greg and I were personally struggling. I mean, big time at that season in our marriage. And we had anger pretty much ruling our home with both of us. And we couldn't get out of this perspective where we saw each other based on how we were behaving and continually reacted to it. 
And it was when the Lord invited me and said, let me show, your show me who I made your husband to be. Let me show you this perspective. And so this perspective, this is sin, I believe. No, nope, leave it. Thank you, though. I believe sin, truly, is not about our behavior. It's about an agreement. And you can put whatever word you... Agreement with evil, agreement with darkness, agreement with Satan. It is an agreement with negativity. Negativity comes, makes a suggestion, and you agree with it. Here's what it produces. Right? But there is another agreement made possible by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, right? Because Jesus said, I came to awaken you to your true selves. That's what he came to do. He goes, I came to awaken you. I came to awaken you that we are co-children of a God. And I came to awaken you that, to that so that you could have a relationship with who? The Holy Spirit, who is wisdom. So that greater things can you do than even I have done. So he goes, I want you to have this relationship with the Holy Spirit. And I believe that faith isn't something we magically believe. Faith is an agreement with God. So we have an agreement with negativity or we have an agreement with God. And it is Jesus who awakens us to the possibility of new agreements. So my agreement, I couldn't figure out who my husband was anymore because he did not appear to me to be the man that I married. He was the most magnificent man that I had ever met in my entire life. And then we entered into anger. And go ahead. Well, and, and was, God and told you no what right I was. Head. Yes. So, which was this great man all along, right? It really was. It so was. So when the Lord said to me, He goes, "Okay, so you're seeing this." He goes, "I need to show you who who." Think of it this way. You know, before the world began, God thought in His mind of the most magnificent person ever that He wanted to spend all of eternity with. And that idea was so good that he said, oh, we have to make that real. And that idea was you. He had an idea of us in his mind, and he agreed with it so much that we became who we are. And what sin has done, that perspective has done, is delusioned us to think that we're something that we're not. It's almost like, and this is what I was taught. Maybe some of you were taught this too. I was taught that sin mars us so significantly that we can't ever hope to be who God made us to be until after we die. Anybody ever, right? I felt like the Lord said, I'm sorry, I have to contradict this because here's how this works. It's as if Ange, and he even showed me, I was driving down the road and I saw this truck and it was all beat up. Like it was a beautiful old vintage truck and you could tell that someone was trying to restore it, but it had been dented in a lot of places. It had been, you know, like they were trying to restore it. And I could tell that like, they were in process. And the Lord said, it's just like that truck, Ange. That truck, it banged up, beat up. In fact, it could even go to a junkyard and be crushed into a little tiny cube, but it's not gonna stop being a truck. It's never, it's not gonna turn into a giraffe. It's not going to turn into a car. It's going to always be a truck. No matter how unrecognizable it is, it doesn't change its an, an essential identity. And he goes, that's true for all of humanity. I don't care how banged up, crushed, beat up, hit and hurt that has happened in any person's life. It doesn't change who God made us to be. So we may be unrecognizable from our original selves and the original thought of God, but it doesn't change sin. That perspective doesn't change who we are. So he said to me, this isn't about Greg trying to get to something he's never been. This isn't about your child with autism or your other child who also has issues trying to get to something they've never been. This is about awakening their true identity. That makes all the difference. And so I said, okay, what's his true identity? And the Lord said, Greg is... What did he tell you? Hmm, really? Yeah, you have to say it. I have to... Yeah. Why me? Because he told you. <laughs> but you, yes, okay. Well, he, but you now agree with this. Yes. Yes, okay. So... Probably. <laughs> do you say... He's a man of few words. Mostly. But there are times. There are times. See, he's, he's becoming fully convinced. So the Lord said to me, you need to look up what Greg's name means. You need to look it up. 
and oh, I went, that's okay. what you wanted me to say. Yeah. So I said, <laughs> did you really not know you no. weren't teasing? You just have to tell me. I have no idea what you're talking about right now. Help me out. Throw me a bone. Okay? That'll work. Watchman on the wall. Yes. <laughs> so I looked up Greg's name and it said Watchman on the wall, and I'm like, what is that? What is that? I, that's the dude who stands up there who's the low-level paid guy because he can't really do anything else that's super skilled and he's standing You don't learn there. about him in the movie. He's the first to die by some arrow. Right. It's he's persistent guy. and he stands there, but he's not so smart, right? So the Lord goes, no, 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 no. That's not what a watchman on the wall is. A watchman on the wall is the guy who stands up like on a fort or a space or a city or a community of people and says, no harm will come to them. A watchman on the wall is the person who stands for an uncontended space. And he goes, and that's why he's being attacked to believe that he's something completely different. It's because of who he is that this is even happening. And so he's being pressed to think that he's the dude that's like letting all the junk in. That's who he is. So when I first proposed this to Greg, what did you say to me? <laughs> Sorry, I'm like, I am so, you said. About, well, that's the way I am. Yeah, you, he said, that's baloney. Yeah. I think BS with the actual words was what he said. <laughs> and he said, that's not true. That's not who I am. I don't even know what that means, but that's not what I am. And the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. There you go. I am what I am. I am what I am, and this is all you get. And I said, well, <laughs> we have no future if that's the truth. <laughs> so I'm going to agree with a different perspective. I'm going to agree with a different perspective. And the Lord started to show me that an agreement with God was not a belief. It wasn't a fantasy. It wasn't a hope. It was asking him what he has to say and agreeing with it. And I started to learn over a period of days and weeks and months and years that when one person agrees with God, it is greater than an entire city's agreement with negativity. When All right, I'm going to interrupt. Yes. You need a time check. Okay. You're so good. I love you. You're good at that. So on this side, what we've heard in scripture is that this is like the flesh. This is the old nature. This is the sin nature. On this side, We've heard it very much spoken, spoken about in scripture that this is the new nature, the new creation. This is when we come into the perspective of God, we, come, we are a new creation because we now have the Holy Spirit awakened in us. And we now have, in fact, that song, Oh How He Loves, that song was the first song that I ever experienced God's actual communication with me. Before that, I just really hated worship. Yes, I actually would say that out loud. I just, I never felt like it ever spoke to me. I never felt like I ever heard the Lord. I always heard like, you're a fake, you're singing these words, you don't even know what these words mean. You know, I mean, it was, it was, that's all I felt during songs. Like, and all these people be worshiping and having these great experiences and I'm, I'm in hell. Yeah, I would like go to the bathroom during worship at church because I just never felt that. But I went, Lord, I know you have something for me. And so he opened up this one song and it says, He's jealous for me. He loves like a hurricane. I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. And all of the sudden, I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory. And I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me. Oh, how he loves him so. Oh, how he loves us. How he loves me so. And I saw it. I saw the Lord go, I can move you from this perspective that has locked you into an angry, abusive household. And I can move you into a perspective where you can do nothing but win. I can show you who he is and your agreement with me can open an atmosphere and a space where they can see it for themselves. And that's where everything started to change. And Greg, and I still remember, and this is where I'm going to end. 
I still remember the moment we were in a fight right before we got on a 14 hour trip to Colorado and um, I was like, I don't think we can like live in a car with this much um, tension. So I said, you take a time out, I'll take a time out. Right? And yeah, I remember that. <laughs> and he went to the bedroom and I went somewhere else and, we, and he came back out and he was like whiter than he already is, which is really, really white. <laughs> and um, his eyes were super big and he said to me, I think I just saw for the first time ever that anger isn't who I am. I am not anger. Anger is coming after me. See, he saw all of this negativity as coming from him. See, that's what we were taught, right? We have to keep dealing with ourselves. We have to keep correcting ourselves. We have to take up our cross. I think that's a misunderstanding of those scriptures. And so we keep, the more we deal with it, the bigger it gets. The more we try to discipline our kids and the more we try to correct them into the right thing, the bigger it becomes. Instead of going, you have been affected and attacked by a perspective that is not you. And that perspective isn't coming from you, it's coming at you. That's the difference. I'm not impatient, I am being pressed by impatience to think that it is me. And if I agree, if I agree, I am now in sin because then it bears its own fruit. Do you know that it only gets its power when we agree with it? Our agreement is what gives negativity a place in the earth. <sighs> Woo! Which is why we are- You have to say some for next week, babe. Co-creators with God, and it is our agreement with God that releases our identity. And so we both started to agree that Greg is a watchman on the wall and creates an uncontended space. And we started to agree with God about who I am. And Greg actually started creating then proclamations over yep. our family. Yep. yep. And we're in with that. Can we talk about that? Yeah, just for a quick second. All right. So I wanted to start agreeing with God more. And um, I didn't really know how to do that. And so I started writing down things that I wanted to pay different, that I thought um, needed to be different in our house, in our home, in our family. And so I'd write down these things that... I'm, Sorry, I mean, you never let me have the whiteboard marker, but I'm doing it while you're talking. All right. Okay, go ahead. And so, um, so I, would st I wrote down these things I want to be different, and I would speak them. I would speak them out loud um, daily by myself. Um, and uh, I think the, the spoken word has, is really important, uh, speaking things out loud. It's how God created things, and uh, I think that made a lot of difference that way by speaking them out loud. And then over time, I would come to the realization that uh, uh, some of these things may have been disagreements, things I didn't want to happen, but they weren't really agreements with God necessarily. And so you would, I would change and modify those statements so they would be more in agreement with God, and I would keep speaking those out. But the really cool thing is they came to happen. So that was a really cool thing. The cool thing was he, he went, our life would be totally transformed if these things happened. Our lives would be totally different. And then one day he came in and he goes, I don't even know what to proclaim anymore because they've all happened. Yep. And some of them we didn't even know about in the house. No. I didn't even know what he was proclaiming and it started to happen and I didn't even know it. So I was being transformed by his agreement with God about me and I didn't even know yep. what it was. And all it was was me practicing, yeah. trying to agree with God. Which is really what God said was possible when he said, I want you to have dominion over the whole earth. Walk in your true dominion and partnership with me, that when you agree with me, things transform. So I just put this little quick thing and we're going to end our message here, which is we were born into sin, which I thought was we were born into disobedience. Do you know that's actually not biblical? <laughs> I know, crazy, you can look it up, it's super fun. So, we were born into sin, which I believe a better way of describing it is a perspective that is death to us. We're born into, we're born into a perspective that is harmful to us. We all, at an early age, feel ashamed, we feel bad, we feel like we have to hide things, we feel like we have to blame or accuse other people. We're born into that perspective, none of us chose it, we're born into it. And God says, Jesus says, by way of me, you can be born again into the spirit, which is a new perspective. Not born into obedience, not born into a behavior, born into a perspective that is life. This perspective brings death to the mind, body, and the emotions. But this perspective brings life to the mind, body, and emotions. 
And it is that perspective that is, do you know how quick it is to, you can change your mind? Faster than I can snap my fingers. We can think new thoughts faster than that sound got to your ears. That's how easy. The yoke really is easy and the burden is light. The reason why it hasn't felt that way is because we've all been hammering away at behavior. That sucker's hard. <laughs> but touching on a perspective and a shift, a boy with Down syndrome gave me that gift. <laughs> to help me think a higher thought. To help me think of things and see things differently. What? <laughs> Yay. All right, we're going to bring kids in. So if someone would take, go out and grab children. Yay. Really? You just pulled her back? <laughs> Miss Julie. Thank you, Miss Julie. And while we do that, we're going to take this time um, because we always have a practice. Because we have come to realize that coming into the perspective of God is actually faith, that the currency of the kingdom and of living in God's goodness is learning how to partner with him. How can we partner with him if we don't know how he's thinking? A anyone? <laughs> We can't, right? We can't partner with God in our marriages, in our parenting, in our businesses. We can't partner without knowing what he's thinking. And so we got to get a whole lot better at knowing how he sees things. We got to get a whole lot more confident and practice. And so this is what we do every week is we practice. Now, I know that practice takes practice. When you went out on the soccer field or lacrosse or anybody on a sports team ever, who was the chess champion of something or another, right? Or any kind of, you do football, right? Okay, the first time you ever played, I'm sorry, were you a genius on the football field or maybe not so much, right? Maybe not so much. Most of us, not so much, right? We needed what? Practice. We needed for our bodies to learn how to do it right. Well, guess what? We need to learn how to hear God accurately by practicing. That means that we just go, Lord, I believe that it's easy to hear from you because you made me to hear from you easily. And I'm going to now practice hearing you and I'm going to share with someone else and then we're going to talk about it and find